Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God, excuse me, jump to verse 31 and uh, just see this summary. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. And then the chapter 2, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So what we read in verse in, in the at the end of chapter 1 was the end of a, a summary of the seven days of creation, the six days, and then he begins chapter 2 with day 7. And now he goes back to day six, and he gives us a fuller explanation of the creation of humanity. So verse five, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land, and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, in verses 10 through 14, he gives a description of some of the natural resources and the location, the rivers, minerals. And then in verse 15, a summary statement again, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. When I was nine years old, our family lived in the Washington, D.C. area. And my brother came home from school one day and he told my parents that he wanted to go to Scotland on an exchange trip with his school. And my dad said, it's great, love for you to go, but you have to get a job and pay for it. So my brother was 12 years old. It was rough in my household back in those days. And uh, he got a job delivering the Washington Post. So going to apartments, delivering the newspaper. And I would help him. Seven days a week, he would get up, 5.30, deliver the paper, and on some mornings, I would help him. And the manager said, you know, usually we don't hire anyone this young, but I know your dad, and we're going to give you a chance. And my brother did a great job. And so when I was almost 11, the manager said, well, I'm not going to tell you what they called me back then because it wasn't Brian. (laughs) My nickname was Happy. It's hard to outlive that nickname. And uh, I got a paper route when I was almost 11. So I got up, 5.30, got on my bike, went to the neighborhood, door-to-door, delivering papers. And then every month, I would have to go and collect the money. Knock on the door, collect the money. So there I was, 11 years old, boom, 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 you owe me this, pay up. And so I learned a lot. I learned a lot in this experience. I learned that, number one, not all paper routes are created equal. My brother had apartments. I had houses, so he could do more apartments in the time that I did houses. I learned that uh, not everyone who orders a paper pays for the paper. And that getting the work is one thing, but getting paid is altogether different. Uh, I learned that it's easier to spend what you make Then to make what you make, there was a donut shop on my way home. (laughs) I had a lot of donuts in those days. See, my dad believed that work 
was foundational for life. And that's what we see in Genesis 1 and 2. We see the foundations of creation laid out for us. We find here the foundations for who we are as people, for what we're supposed to do, for marriage, for family, for gender, for work, for all types of things. And it's provided for us right here in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And so we're going to look at this passage and look at these foundations, and we're going to try to answer three important questions. Who are we? What do we do? And how do we do it? Who are we? We're going to understand a little bit about our basic identity as made in the image of God. What do we do? This passage actually gives us a job description. And then we also see the basics and the foundations of how we're supposed to do it. And we heard last week, Edward preached an excellent message. If you didn't hear this message on God and how God worked for six days and rested on the seventh and the implications of all that, I want to just give you two or three takeaways that are very important for us. That number one, we saw everything belongs to God and that we should not compartmentalize life, that we should look at life and see that everything is God's and that the tendency that we have to separate that which is spiritual and that which is secular, and we have this artificial divide in our own thinking, is not a biblical way to understand life or creation. It's not really what God teaches us in his word, and we certainly see that here in Genesis 1 and two. Now, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about the most significant moments in my life spiritually. So when I was at a seminary studying God's Word, I had an experience in the Spirit of God. And it, it was a paradigm shift for me that the, the Holy Spirit works in a way that I had never imagined possible, and it changed the way I viewed and thought. And then I came here, and I started pastoring, and eventually I became the lead pastor, and I was preaching all the time, and I was in the Word of God, and I had uh, an experience where I realized that I'm actually reformed, that I believe in the doctrines of grace, and that there's a, that, that I had gone to a seminary where you were laid out a bunch of options, but it was kind of presented like, well, you can choose any one of these options, and I realized, no, no, wait, wait, there are actually specific, clear teachings in Scripture what I'm describing for you is, that the, in the first case, there was this spiritual renewal. In the second, there was this thinking, intellectual renewal. And in both cases, it almost felt like I was getting saved all over again. This is a whole new world opened up to me. And as I was just thinking about my own journey in the Lord, I identified, well, there are these significant times where God has awakened me to a fuller understanding of who he is and what he does and how he works. And, and, and you carry with you certain things. So uh, I could list community, unity, prayer, a number of things, social justice, and mercy, and helping those that are in need. These are important aspects of my spiritual journey and how God has awakened me to things that I thought I understood and didn't. And you know what's interesting about everything I've just listed out for you? You can have all of those experiences, you can be aware of all of those things and still not know how to connect your faith to what you do on Monday morning. And I need to tell you that as much as I and warning you against compartmentalization, I need to tell you, I was a major compartmentalizer. And I wasn't even aware of it. In fact, I would have preached against it. I would have preached against the separation of the secular and the spiritual. But I didn't really know how to connect my faith to my work. Right? So what is a, what is a good Christian pilot look like? He lands the plane, right? 
What do you want from your Christian pilot? <laughs> you, want him to, you want to get home safe, don't you? And at the right location. And that is actually part of what God has created us to do. John Mark Comer said, what we do is central to our humanness. And you see this laid out for us in Genesis 1 and 2. Again, Tom Nelson, in the church, we often spend the majority of our time teaching people how to live the minority of their lives. Right? So when you get up tomorrow, do you know that God cares not just about what you do, but that actually what you do is worship. That's what this passage will show us. So we want to jump in, and let's get started with question number one, who am I? Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we see that we are made in the image of God. And we find this classic text here laid out for us where we are told... We hear God say, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth, every creeping thing. I am made in the image of God. Um, now, I, I referenced this maybe five or six weeks ago where I had a significant conversation with one of one of my children, one of my sons, David, is 19, and he's a student at Texas A&M, and we, we took a car ride from College Station up to Dallas, about three and a half hours. And David got in the car, and in the car, he said to me, hey, Dad, Dad I want to ask you a question. And I, I have been asking people in my lives this question, and I find out that they generally can't answer it very easily. And I said, okay, what is the, what's the question? He said, how are you unique? How has God uniquely made you? And uh, I started thinking about it, and I said, well, tell me why it is you think people have, have trouble answering this question. He said, very interesting. He said, well, here's my theory. My theory, this is my 19-year-old explaining the meaning of life and the significance of humanity and our struggles. He said... I think it's because we spend so much time trying to fit in and be like everyone else and be accepted that we don't realize that God has uniquely and wonderfully made us. That's good, right? So your mom did a good job with you, son. Right? So for the next couple of hours, we shared with one another how we thought, just speaking to one another about this. Now, now this, is what, this is what's interesting. The Bible tells a story in four parts. We're created in the image of God. We sin against God. We call this part two the fall. And the image of God is marred. It's deeply impacted and affected because of our disconnectedness from God. God sends his son Jesus to restore us to that image, to renew us, to save us, to restore us to relationship with God. And then we look forward to the perfect restoration of all things. Okay, so four parts. Creation, fall, redemption, renewal, you might call it, and the final restoration. Now, I find that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you spend any time in the church you may be very likely to just live in part two of the story, right? I'm very aware that I'm fallen, that I'm sinful, that my relationship with God was broken, and unaware that you were uniquely, wonderfully made in the image of God. Now, I think we need it all. I'm not advocating for... We just, we, I, th I think part of the problem is it all gets distorted when we only see one part. But it will help you understand how Monday connects to what you really believe when you begin to see, no, 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 God made me. I'm unique and wonderfully a reflection of the image of God. And that is impacted by my broken relationship with God and then healed in Christ. 
So I, I hope you'll ask yourself this question. I won't tell you how I answered it or how my son answered it for me. But let me just say this. Let's just try to unpack for a second. What do we mean by made in the image of God? I've just given you some words up here to help you understand the ideas and, and, and make some associations. So when God says, let us make man in our image, the word here in the Hebrew is translated also as idol or statue. It's a replica. And the leader, the king, would put his statue all over his kingdom and it would be a representation of him and a reminder that he rules. And those are the ideas that are being communicated here. Similar is the language that we are made in the likeness of God. We are made to resemble God. We're told here that we've been given dominion. And so we discover that we are, we are created to represent God, we resemble Him, and we are made to rule with Him. And what, what are some of the ways that we resemble God? Well, we talk about the ability to relate. We are relational. We're rational, our, our intellectual and creative abilities, and righteous. We have a moral understanding of right and wrong. And so we are made in the image of God. This is who I was originally created to be. And so I need to understand this because it's, it's foundational for, for who I am. And we move to question number two. What do I do? And we see in a couple of places, let's go to, um, let's go to Genesis 1, 28 to start with. We read, and God blessed them and said to them, and now notice five things that we're commanded to do. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves over the face of the earth. So it's been said in some ways this is, this is sort of a job description for us. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. So be fruitful. We're to be productive, to generate increase. I think this is given to us in a general, general not specific way. We are to create. Secondly, we're to multiply. And this is the first idea directly applied to family, to having children. So it's God's will for us to, to have children, to live in family, to multiply in this way, to be fruitful. Um, one of the challenges with preaching a series like this is uh, we, when we talk about work, we think only in certain categories. So if you're here and you're, you're retired or you say, well, I don't... I don't, I don't necessarily have a career in the conventional sense. Uh, I, I believe that all of our life is work unto the Lord. In whatever season we're in, whatever phase we're in, we're to be fulfilling this job description given the place and time in which we now live. So Edward, in his message last week, he talked about days one through three. God did what? He formed and days four, five, and six, he filled. And in many ways, you see God calling us to do that only in reverse order. We fill, right? We, we're to be fruitful, we're to increase, we're to spread out, we're to multiply. But then also, we're to shape, we're to subdue, to have dominion. So the idea of subdue is that we're to bring order to creation. We're to take a forest and turn it into a field and a field into farmland. We're to, we're to bring order and to develop and to have dominion, to ex exercise God's loving authority and power for the good of people and the good of creation. Then we see at the end of the account, this verse, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. General description of your job description. To work and take care of it. Um, the, the words are very specific. The word for work is also translated in the Hebrew Bible, translated into English as service or even worship. 
And this is a very direct reference to the idea that your work is service to God, it's worship to the Lord, and that everything belongs to God. There is not a separation in what we do. Work is one of the ways that we worship. So we sang songs today. We want to do that to the glory of God. We, we give as a part of our worship. We pray. All of those things are important aspects to a life of worship. But so is work. And it is described as worship. We are to take care of it. We are to watch over, to protect, to care for, to guard, to, to develop, to f- help creation fulfill its potential. This is the work of the Lord for us. So when we compartmentalize, and I confessed to you earlier that this, is, this has been a bit of a blind spot at times in my own life, you know that you're compartmentalizing when you see that what you do Monday through Saturday is just about, uh, okay, work is what I do so that I'll have money to give to the work of the Lord. Now, it's actually, that's actually a biblical idea, but it's not the only reason you work. You also might know that you're compartmentalizing when you say things like, uh, well, I work Monday through Friday because I live for the weekends, I live for vacation, I live for retirement. Any amens? <laughs> okay, that's not a biblical idea, right? It's, it's a way of saying, okay, my real living takes place only in these certain categories, right? Or you might say, well, I work just so I can share my faith where I work. I think God wants us to share, to share our faith where we work. I think he wants us to work so we have something to give. I think it's great when we enjoy the weekends and vacation and, and retirement and time off. But those are not exclusive answers to the question of why are we working. We're working because God made us to work and work brings glory to God and the work itself is worship. Now, in some occupations, it's really easy to see what that looks like in some vocations But wherever you're at, you have this opportunity to work unto the Lord. No matter what season of your life you're in, no matter what you're doing, no matter what you believe God's called you uh, to do. So we have some first responders here. It obviously glorifies the Lord every time you save a life, you put out a fire, you you work to help others. Um, it's, that's low-hanging fruit for us to see those connections, right? But also, there's the less obvious connections that everything we do uh, is helpful to humanity. You know what would be helpful for Fort Lauderdale right now? Someone who can fix sewage lines. <laughs> right? If you live... Uh, I, I, I was with... Uh, Tom Hendricks, my good friend who pastors Rio Presbyterian, and he lives in the neighborhood, and many of his church people live in the neighborhood, and he said, man, we just have these constant problems of these sewage lines breaking, and it's, it's one of the wealthiest areas of Fort Lauderdale. And I said, Tom, well, it's obvious. You have so much, you can't get rid of your waste. <laughs> you just share it with the rest of us. And we laughed. We had a good laugh about it. Um, this is service unto the Lord. All right, so let me try. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to give you the ABCs. I'm going to try to summarize this in the ABCs of work. Abundance, blessing, and cultivation. We are called to bring increase, to bring God's fruitfulness, to bring abundance. We do it as a blessing unto the Lord and blessing to others and blessing to creation. And we're also to bring cultivation, to develop it, to help it to, to help reach the potential um, that is before us, to make it better. This is a very, just very simple general outline. You have to be a little creative in the way you apply it. But I, I want you to have some sense of tomorrow when you get up, being aware of, okay, this is what a job well done looks like as I offer myself to the Lord in worship. I want to I bring increase. 
I want to do it as a blessing to others. So if you don't understand that second part, then we're in trouble, right? If we're just about having more, but we do it at the expense of the well-being of other people, that's not honoring to the Lord, that's not worship. So we bring abundance as a blessing, and we do it as part of cultivation. So Tim Keller gives this definition of work. Work is rearranging the raw materials of God's creation in such a way that it helps the world in general and people in particular thrive and flourish. Now, I didn't read, I didn't read chapter 2, verses 10 through 14, but I referenced it where the four rivers are described and the minerals and the gold and, and the resources that God has put in creation and the emphasis on the garden. And we, we are reading Genesis 1 and 2. And when that gets here, I mean, we see some of the references. I mean, some, some, of, the, some of the reasons why these are referenced. But I think in part, God is helping us understand. Listen, I'm giving you the raw materials because I want you to work, to subdue, to cultivate, to produce. Um, I think... I think it was said last week, right? God, God didn't create a table. He created wood and gave us the ability to make it. And this is part of God's call for us. This is a great idea from Dorothy Sayers. She says, the church's approach to an intelligent carpenter, carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and to come to church on Sundays. Because this is, this is usually what the church has done historically with a, a carpenter. Don't get drunk, come to church. What the church should be telling him is this. The, the very first demand that his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. It's good, isn't it? Rearranging the raw materials of God's creation in a way that brings thriving and human flourishing. We bring cultivation um, and help toward the development of what God has made. Did you notice in the, in the section of Genesis 2-5 that, okay, wait, wait a minute, I, I read the seven days of creation, but then when I get back and I look more deeply at the creation of mankind, there was this time when there was no rain, this mist is coming up from the ground, and and God says, okay, there's, there's something lacking in the development of my creation. And so mankind, man, male and female, are created to help develop God's creation. And the emphasis there that God has called us to, to, this, to this great work. Okay, so l let me just um, take a second and explain that there are a couple of dangers that we fall into in this area. One is, as soon as we start to say that everything you do Monday through Friday in your work happens to, uh, it, it all honors God and it's all worship to God and it's all important and we're called to bring God's development. One of the dangers is what has been called triumphalism. It's this idea that we're going to force people we're going to exercise dominion in a way where we force everyone to worship Christ and worship God, and we're going to take control of politics and the arts and everything. And so there's this kind of domination, which is one error that we will make. And that was really the whole approach in the medieval times. So if you were a heretic, what happened to you in the... yeah. We burned you, yeah, we, to the glory of God, right? I mean, it's crazy. And then there's another area, and when the Reformation took place, the Anabaptists reacted to those abuses and said, Christians should not be in politics, they should not be involved in the arts, they should not even vote, they can't participate in the military, and we withdrew, or at least that particular group withdrew. And... 
Luther came along and said, hey, as part of the Reformation, he looked at the Psalms and he, talked, he, he saw the psalmist praising God for all of God's provision. And he said, listen, God, God is praised for his protection and his provision, but what's happening is in all of those cases, he's using people to provide it. And that this is a very important part of us understanding how God desires to bring his blessing to all of his creation. So the ABCs, we, we, we want to we wanna bring increase, we want to bring God's blessing, and we want to bring cultivation. Okay, I'm, I'm almost out of time, which means I am out of time. And so I will just, just tell you, um, the, the, the third point, you come back, I'll talk about more next week about how we do it. We do it in relationship with God. We do it because... We have God's blessing. We do it. I mean, God speaks his blessing on Adam and Eve. And that blessing is, is replaced with a curse, at least in part, when we are broken in our relationship with God. And that is restored in Jesus, right? But I was thinking about why we bought this sh shopping center as a, as a church. That we bought this shopping center... And it was empty. And literally, when you look at the exterior roof, the decorative roof around the building, the shingles were falling off. And there were these huge areas where there were no shingles. And the whole front was just in complete disarray. Um, and um, we began to develop this property. It was largely empty. And... We bought it for $2.9 million. It had been sold off the tax rolls for a million dollars before that because no one wanted it. We believed that God was calling us to be a blessing to the city. Now, I, I, we can't take credit for this. I certainly can't take credit for this. But now the city has told us that this property is the, is, is the city center and that the library and the charter school and city hall and the police station... That this is strategically located, and we are a key part of their financial development for the entire city of North Lauderdale. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Right? Yeah. So Edward went over to City Hall, and he got, a, he got a copy of the financial development plan, and they listed it all out, and they have a wonderful plan for our property. <laughs> and then you know what they said? They said uh, challenges, and they list a bunch of challenges, and then one of the challenges was... The church owns the shopping center. <laughs> and I think we have an opportunity to show them they're wrong, right? To say that we are a part of that development. We're a part of economic development. We're a part of helping young people uh, be educated. And that our plan, and we met this week with the city manager, or we met with one of the city developers, and we said, listen, tell us more about how we can be a blessing to this city. And we said, listen... You know, we don't have the money, but we, we want to buy this little strip center here, and we want to buy the gas station, and we want to buy the Polish American Club. If you're Polish and you're a part of that club, come see us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now listen, so just imagine, just dream with me for a minute, right? So a beautification that keeps going. I mean, this property is so much nicer than it was when we bought it, to the glory of God. And... I've been told we have two empty bays in the entire shopping center of 22 tenants, and we have people interviewing for those spaces. But listen, I'm envisioning pavers, lampposts, park benches, the land across the street being developed. We don't have to own it, but we can be a part of it, all for the glory of God. Right? This little strip center is... is is known for being a place where bad things happen, where drugs are trafficked and all kinds of problems. We'd like to, we'd like to change that. Amen. Because it's a part of God's call for us. And it's God's call for you where you live and where you work and what you do. Amen. And you can't do it alone, but we're called to do it in relationship with God and it's restored unto us in Jesus. Now, you, we have this opportunity to unpack this, right? All semester as we are in our small groups together. And what I want to do is I want to bring Gabriel de Jesus up here. We're going to close with just a, a, a quick moment with Gabriel. Come up here, Gabriel. 
And I want to talk about Gabriel is, I have to resist the temptation to tell you Gabriel's whole story. Gabriel came to us Easter Sunday, was their, their first Sunday with us, right? That's right. And Gabriel, I want to ask you just two or three questions that's connected to this topic. I want to ask you, number one, this time tomorrow, what will you be doing? Okay. Well, good morning, Riverside. Uh, good morning. Um, just to let you know, so I am a marketing director at a uh, construction prep school, so I have to come up with course development, uh, course uh, basically product placement, social media, videos, things like that. Okay, great. So what does a job well done look like? Well, uh, marketing is linked also to sales, but at the same time, a good job well done is to, for me, is to see customers that would see a video and they get exactly what that video is telling them that it's gonna sell them. So it's not just overselling them, it's actually providing a content and then feeling happy that they receive what we promised that we were gonna give them. Oh, that's good. I happen to know that Gabriel's very good at what he does because he produces a lot of the videos that you get to see uh, for Riverside. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are some of the Tell us how we can pray for you. What are the big challenges that you face? Well, definitely working in an environment where sometimes in, in marketing, everything is just sales, sales, sales. And you can divide the aspect of how God can be part of something like that way. You know, where, where you're saying to yourself, you have to produce content to bring people. Uh, and, and just battling with yourself as, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, saying, my first job is to glorify God. That's number one. And how do I do this by providing a product, but at the same time having people say, okay, I, I, I received that service and it was well done. And what is it that you have that I don't have? Why is it that you serve me that way? So the struggle is always to keep that in mind when sometimes sales might be the number one uh, priority in a business. Oh, that's good. That's good. Okay, this is what we're going to do. If you are, don't go anywhere, Gabriel. Stay right there. If you are in this area of marketing, creative design, if you are in the field of creative arts, design, and entertainment, some of those vocations might be arts, design, entertainment, you're an artist, graphic design, fashion design, interior design, you're a producer, a film editor, a musician, singer, writer, editor, photographer, videographer, you do radio, any of those kind of things, we want to pray for you. So if you're in this field of creative arts, design, and entertainment, would you stand up? Just stand up right where you're at. We're going to pray for you. Yeah, don't be bashful. Stop trying to leave, Gabriel. Just stand right here. <laughs> give, give me the microphone. All right, we're going to pray for you as a representative of all those in, in this field. All right, so what you do is important to the Lord and to us, and we want to commission you. Friends, we are praying for God to bring renewal all over South Florida, and it's going to happen in you and through you wherever God sends you. So what you do is important. Let's just take a second and pray. Lord, we come right now. Um, we thank you for, for beautiful expressions and all that we're able to do through design and through art and through... Uh, uh, marketing, Lord, how a message is delivered and how values are communicated and how you are potentially honored and glorified. And we want to pray, we want to pray that these individuals would be granted this morning a sense of just how significant what they actually do moment by moment is and that it matters and that it's a part of of bringing your abundance, bringing your blessing, bringing cultivation to your world. And Lord, that they would experience your pleasure, your favor, your anointing. And that God, you would also, as Gabriel just shared, that sometimes it's all about a bottom line and uh, just, just more, that you would help, help these individuals to navigate through that complicated world, that they would have increased, that they would be productive, that they would be fruitful, but that it would be in a way that truly blesses other people. 
and that you would give them grace to overcome and to, to, to see you use them. And we pray and believe you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.